What hope of means of safety do you deem easy, venerable man? I look to you, for neither from this land by secret flight can we escape. Each avenue is held by guards too strong for us, nor in our friends do we have any hope in salvation. If your thoughts suggest anything, propose it. Let not instant death overtake us. Daughter, it is no easy or slight task to advise earnestly without ordeal. Since we are weak, let us just delay. Have you need of more pain, or do you so love life? I rejoice in heaven's sweet light and cherish hope. And I. Yet vain is hope, old man, where hope must fail. In their delays, ills find a remedy. The time in delay is painful and afflicts me. Some prosperous course may yet be opened, daughter, for you and me to escape these present evils. My son, your husband, may perhaps yet return. But remain calm, and from your children's eyes dry those flowing tears. Calm them with stories, a soothing but a wretched fallacy. For even the sufferings of mortals waste away, and the blasts of storms do not keep their strengths always. The fortunate are not fortunate to the end, Everything changes and is different from before. The best man is the one who always trusts in hope. The coward gives up. Leaning on my staff, I come to the high roofed halls and the old man's home. Like the swan foretelling ill, I come to pour the mournful songs. Nothing except words is left me now. A lifeless vision of the night I seem, the phantom of a dream. Though these words tremble, yet friendly shall they flow. Unhappy orphans, for you are without a father's guardian power. You poor old man, and you afflicted woman, how is your heart with bitter anguish pained? For your lost husband is kept in Hades' house. Do not hurry my feeble frame as up the craggy steep faintly and slowly on I creep like the colt drawing the heavy cart and as I go with infirm step gently lead this heavy burden support me by the robe and by the hand I an old man will support an old man just as a young man when I grasped the youthful spear and shield I was there together in the toils of my age mates and brought no disgrace on my fatherland Behold these boys, how stern their brow, their father's spirit flashing from their eyes. They too his hapless fortune know, as they his manly grace retain. O oh, Greece, if bereft of these, what firm allies you will lose. But I see the monarch of this land, Lycos, advancing to this house, he's here. I might ask the father and the wife of Heracles, and of course I may, since I am your master, find out what I want to know. In what confiding do you seek to prolong your life? What hope presents itself? Why do you expect not to die? Do you think that from the realms of Hades, where he lies, the sire of these will come? Thus you raise your grief since you must die so unbecomingly, you who many an empty boast has spread through Greece, that Zeus once shared thy bed and gave this strange son birth, and you who you are called the wife of the bravest man. Yet by your husband what illustrious deed has been achieved if he destroyed and slew the marsh-bred Hydra, or Nemean beast, which in his nets he caught, saying he grasped it in his arms and strangled it, on this presume you to contend with me. Is it for this the sons of Heracles ought not to die? Who, with no merit, held the reputation of daring courage, that with beasts he fought in naught beside his prowess proved. His left hand never knew to raise the shield, never came near the spear, but held the bow, a coward's weapon and was always ready for flight. No proof of manhood, none of daring courage is the bow, best shown by him who, remaining steadfast, dares to face the rapid spear and the furrowed wounds it cuts. Think not, old man, 
What now I do takes rise from insolence, but caution. Well I know, I slew her father Creon and possess his throne. I therefore have no use for these boys to grow up and leave them to revenge my deeds. Welcome to Readings in Greek Tragedy Online. I'm Joel Christensen from Brandeis University, and I'm here with members of the Center for Hellenic Studies, the Cosmos Society, and Out of Chaos Theater. The actors you just saw were Evelyn Miller playing the part of Megara, Richard Neal playing the part of Amphitryon, Paulo Mahoney as the whole chorus, and Tim Delap as Lycus. Now this play was performed around 416 BCE and its Greek name is Heracles Minominos, Heracles Insane or Madden. And the hero starts off stage um, in the underworld try, as he completes his famous labor to retrieve the hellhound Kerberos, um, but he eventually ends up in Thebes trying to save his wife Megara and their children from the sentence of death. Now, when I teach Heracles in, in a myth class, I focus on how the hero explores boundaries of what it means to be a human. In this part of his narrative, audiences are invited to think about the danger of heroic figures, what they represent to those whom they try to protect. Now the play begins with a monologue from Amphituon, Heracles' mortal father, the husband of his mother, Alcmene. He provides gene genealogies of Thebes and sets the story where, that we're about to witness, um, that King Lycus is planning to have his children killed um, and that there's nothing they can do but sit as suppliants in the sanctuary of Zeus. Megara appears on stage and asks the important question, where is Heracles? Now today we have with us an expert on this play, Anne-Sophie Noel, um, who has some more framing comments for us before we move to the next scene. Um, so thanks very much for having me. I'm, I'm very glad to take part in this fantastic reading and discussion. So I'm in France, in Lyon now, it's the evening, but um, my daughter is sleeping so I can now really focus on this. Um, yes, yeah, so, I think just to make a um, connection with the, the session last week, um, the, you read um, Sophocles' Philoctetes, and there is a, a direct connection between the, between the two plays, because as you may remember, uh, Philoctetes introduces himself as the lord of the bow of Heracles. And today, in a way, we're having the prequel of uh, Philoctetes, we, we're having the story um, that happens before Heracles transmits this bow to Philoctetes. And we heard already in the, in the prologue that um, um, Lycus is questioning the value, the heroic value of the bow. And again, this weapon will be at the center of the, of the story. Um, in Philoctetes, the bow was um, um, chased after by Odysseus and Neoptolemus because they, according to a prophecy, they know that it's the weapon that they need in order to win the victory in Troy. And in Heracles, it's also a central weapon um, um, because Heracles will use this bow and arrows and he will kill you know, horrible way in the course of the tragedy. So maybe I, I don't want to say now who is going to kill. Maybe some of the listeners haven't read the play or doesn't know the play, and you will discover this with us today. So no spoiling um, now. But what I want to say, maybe just a bit of context about um, Euripides um, and Aristotle in his poetics say that Euripides was the most tragic of the ancient Greek tragedians. So tragigotatos in Greek, really the most tragic. We don't really know why he says that because he, he doesn't explain. So it's a bit frustrating, but I think it's very, it seems to be very relevant to Heracles to this play because we will have an action packed plot with some gripping suspense and most of all, very tragic reversals and very pathetic death um, and so, of course, the main character is Heracles himself. So this very, the, the most fa famous hero in Greece, he's a bigger than life character who has accomplished a number of heroic and civilized, civil, sorry, civilizing deeds. So like killing monsters 
and um, and getting rid of um, a whole lot of evil and plagues. In the play, he's regularly described as the Aristos, the best, the best of all humans and the best of all the Greeks. And in um, his ancient Greek hero in 24 hours, uh, Professor Nash points out that Heracles, the name itself means he who has the Cleos of Hera. So he has Cleos, Cleos is the fame, the heroic fame. He has Cleos built into his name. So he's very, very much associated with this glory, this, this fame. But this most famous hero will be confronted to the death of his own wife, Megara, and um, of their children. He will be confronted to, to guilt. And um, something that is also quite important to know before the play starts is that these terrible events will, will happen um, at the end, of, not from the beginning of the hero's life, which was the more traditional version of all the, the mythical uh, variants of um, the story, but this very tragic episode is moved to the ends of his labors. So after the famous 12 labors to make the reversal of fortune experience even more vertiginous and even more gripping. So that's a play which will deeply um, question the very possibility of being a hero. And maybe we we'll see how it can resonate um, with today's situation, how can people be hero in this time, in these very difficult times. So, um, yes, would you like to add something, Joel, before moving to the next team? No, I think that's a great way of framing how, um, I especially like how you focused on that this is a Heracles out of the traditional order, right? Megara often mm. comes before the labors. Here, he's mid-labor, the way we find him in the Odyssey, right? When Odysseus sees him. He's down with, uh, in the underworld, and we're in the upper world, wondering where he is. So yes. in the next scene, that's where we are. Um, Lycus has declared his intention, and we get to meet Megara again on the stage. You, offspring of the earth, whom Ares of old sowed, when the dragon's furious jaws he bared. Will not each raise the staff that his right hand supports and dash it against this man's bleeding head, who, not a Theban, over my land and people most basely rules, alien though he be? Yet never will you rejoice being despot over me, nor will you possess what my hand earned with toil. Go back from where you came, commit your outrage there. While I live, never will you kill the sons of Heracles. For not so far lies he concealed beneath the earth that he forsakes his sons. Since you hold sway here in this land, having destroyed it, he who has helped it does not receive his worthy due. Much I avail my friends by all the zeal I show the dead when friends are wanted most. Oh, my right hand, how you long to grasp the spear, but the desire is lost in weakness, else I would stop you from calling me a slave. With glory might we then inhabit this, our Thebes, in which you now delight. For the city does not think well, which shakes with base sedition and ill counsels, else it would not have required you as despot. Old men, I praise you, for on account of friends, friends must have a just resentment. Yet in our cause, let not your anger rise against your despots. Don't suffer anything. And you, Amphitryon, hear now my opinion if I seem to speak anything worthwhile. I love my children. How can I but love them, whom I brought forth and cherished with fond care? And to die, I think, is terrible. Yet him who strives against necessity I deem but ill-advised. But we, since we must die, we should not die consumed by fire, letting our enemies laugh at us. To me, death is a better evil, and to the honour of our house we owe so much. The glory of the powerful spear is yours, 
let not that glory be tarnished by your death through fear. My well-famed husband needs no witness that he would not wish to save his sons if they gain a poor reputation from it. For the well-born suffer from the disgrace of their children, nor shall I refuse to emulate my noble husband. See now how much I esteem your hope. Do you think that from the realms below your son will come, who of the dead has come back again from Hades? Or do you think that this one will relent to words? Not at all. One must flee a boorish enemy to the wise, whose minds are trained well, we submit, for there a modest gentleness we find. My mind suggests if we prevail to save my sons by exile, what a wretched state is safety with distressful poverty, since from the face of such a guest, each friend will turn, nor longer than a single day behold him with a pleasant eye. Then dare to die with us, since death awaits you anyway. We call forth, old man, the nobleness of your soul, he who strives against the fortune sent by the gods strives but to show his foolishness. For the necessary ill will come. No one can stop it. If, while my arm retained its vigorous force, this insult had been offered, I with ease would have repelled it. But now I am nothing. It is yours then, Amphitryon, to look to it. How best to drive back the impending ill. Not abject fear nor fond desire of life keeps me from death, but I wish for my son to save his sons. It seems I'm in love with the impossible. See, this neck is ready for your sword. Kill me. Hurl me from the rock. Grant me one favour, Lord, I beg you. Kill me and her, the wretched mother, first, so that we not behold the children's death. That unhallowed sight, nor while their warm blood flows, hear them call on their mother and on me, their father's father. For the rest, if you are eager, do it. We have no power to rescue us from death. I am your suppliant too. To grace, add grace, and merit thanks for both. Permit me, King, opening the doors which now are shut against us, to array my children in the dress of death giving them at least a scanty portion from their father's house. Well, so be it. Attendants, open the house. Go in. Array yourselves. I begrudge you not your robes. When you are dressed with such attire as suits you, I will come and send you to the dark realms below. Come then, my sons. Let your unhappy steps attend your mother to your father's house over which others have power and have seized his wealth. The name, as yet, remains with us. In vain, O oh Zeus, did I share my wife with you. In vain am I called together with you, the father of this son. You are less a friend than you seem to be. Immortal as I am, in virtue I surpass you, a mighty God. For I have not betrayed the son of Heracles. Well did you know to come by stealth to my marriage bed, to invade a bed not yours, no leave obtained. But you do not know to save your friends. You are an ignorant God, or you are by nature not just. So this scene then transitions to the chorus, talking again about the glorious deeds of Heracles um, before we eventually bring that great hero on the stage. What I find remarkable about the run up to this scene is how the figures are entrenched in the world where they have no agency, where they have no power, uh, where this despotic king represents sort of this force that they cannot resist. And I think it does, it shouldn't go unmentioned that the chorus is akin with Amphitryon. They are older men who have been sidelined from life, from that strength of force that Heracles represents, just as Megara is sidelined herself. And something's about to happen, but part of the play's central question is, can Heracles actually represent their salvation? And Sophie, what do you think happens when he comes on stage? 
<laughs> Maybe he will not come. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's going to come, but yes, he's going, he's coming quite late and we are witnessing this, this way the, the characters are pushed to death by the tyrants. And indeed, the old men, um, like Amphitryon, the father of, Her of Heracles, are too old to be able to oppose, to oppose the tyrants. And there is also a very interesting dialectic in this, in this prologue, in this beginning of the play, between hope, can we hope to be saved, or do we have to accept to, to, to die? Um, it has something to do with the heroic um, ethics, because when you are a hero, you, if your fate is to die, you have to accept it and you don't, you don't have to resist and you don't have to, you know, to stick to a hope, um, to the hope to be saved or to the hope to stay alive, um, um, thanks to, um, you know, um, a happy reversal. So there is this very, interesting way this dialectic between the two notions is played with because Amphitryon defends the idea that he can hope and that's not being a coward that's just um, that it's just being human and being allowed to to hope for the future of his grandchildren and we can see also what is interesting is that Megara herself um, accepts in a quite heroic way to die. And she, she wants to, to emulate Heracles. She wants to be as heroic as her husband and to face death um, with courage. So that's something that's um, I think quite important in this beginning. And they are now very close to death and they are at the end of the, 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 the sorry, the, the speech of Lycus, they are entering the palace. So if we if we imagine the way it was staged in Euripides' time, so we had this stage building which represented the palace. So they were entering into the palace. They the actors changed the clothes so that they would uh, after they would go out with ritual clothes appropriate for the, for the killing. Um, and it's also a way to show that they will be sacrificed like, you know, like animals, that's a, that's a perverted sacrifice that Lycus will perpetrate on their, on their lives. So, um, uh, yes, what, what I wanted to say, so when they are inside, we, we will have the, the chorus is singing again, he, he's singing the, the second ode glorifying the former deeds of Heracles. So it seems to, to it seems that we are on the verge to witness the, their deaths and it's a very emotional climatic, climactic moment. But let's see what happens next and maybe we'll have a surprise. Look, oh vulnerable man, do I spy my dearest? Or what do I see? Yes, it is he, who we had heard was held beneath the earth, unless we see some dream in the clear light of day. What am I saying? What sort of dream do I see so anxiously? This is none other than your son, old man. Come, children, hang upon your father's robes. Go to him, quickly go, don't linger. Not Zeus himself could be a better saviour for you. I greet you, fair house. My pillared hearth hail, with pleasure reascending to the light, I see you again. Well, what may this mean? Before the house I see my sons, their heads wrapped in the dress of death, and amid a crowd of men, my wife, my father too, in tears at some misfortune. Near them will I stand and ask the cause. Tell me, wife, what new affliction has befallen my house? Oh, most dear of men. Oh, light coming to your father. You are calm, you are safe returning to your friends in their time of need. What do you say? Into what kind of disturbance have I come, father? We are perishing. Pardon me, old man, if first I snatch the words that should be yours. The female is more pitiful than the male, and he was about to kill my children, and I was destroyed. 
by Apollo, what sort of story begins like this? Dead are my brothers and my aged father. How is this done? By whom? What hostile spear? By Lycos, potent monarch of this land. Opposed by the arms of all, or was the land afflicted? By faction. Now he holds power over the seven gates of Thebes. What terror reached you and my father's old age? He intends to kill you, father, me and your sons. What? Did he fear the orphan weakness of my sons? Lest at some time they should offend Creon's death. But why this dress which suits the infernal powers? We wear these coverings in preparation for our deaths. Should you by force have died? Wretched me. We were bereft of friends. We heard you were dead. From what were your minds overwhelmed with this despair? The heralds of Eurystheus brought these tidings. Why then did you leave my house and household gods? We were forced. Your father was dragged from his bed. Did not shame check such rude affront to age? Shame? Lycos lives far from that goddess. Were we so destitute of friends while I was away? Who is a friend to the unfortunate? Are thus my battles with the Minii slighted? Most misfortune, as I said, has no friend. Will you not cast these coverings of Hades from your heads and look upon the light, your eyes rejoicing with that sweet exchange from the dark gloom below? I, for this work requires my hands, will first go and utterly destroy the house of this new tyrant, ripping his unholy head and hurl it to the hungry dogs as prey. However many Thebans requite my good service with evil, this victorious club shall punish. Those that fly, my winged shafts shall reach until all Ismenos is choked with the dead and Dirk rolls her silver tide with blood discolored. Whom should I protect more than my wife, my father and my sons? Farewell, my labors. In vain, I have achieved them for others more than these, that I must die in their defense since for their father, they were to die. Or shall we say it is good that I met the Hydra in battle and the lion sent by Eurystheus, but to keep my sons from death, I will not labor ardently. Ah, may I then be called the glorious conquering Heracles no more. Just it is for the father to guard his sons, his aged father and wedded wife. It is for you, my son, to be a friend to friends and to hate your enemies, but don't act too hastily. In what way do I act faster than I should, father? The king has many allies who are poor, but extolled as rich, and so appearing. Now these have raised seditious tumults and destroyed the cities to plunder their neighbours. All their own wealth wasted away in foul intemperance and sloth. You were seen coming here. Be cautious, then, lest by this band you perish in ambush. I do not care if the whole city saw me. But seeing a bird in an inauspicious place, I knew some ordeal had befallen my house. And so my entrance was with studied secrecy. Excellent. Go then and address Hestia. Look upon your paternal home. The tyrant soon will come with intent to slay your wife, your sons, and to murder me. For you waiting there, everything will come with safety gained. But don't arouse the city, son, till this deed be well achieved. I will this, for you have spoken well. I will go in the house after this tedious absence, having come up from the sunless courts of Hades' queen below, and first I will salute with reverent awe the gods beneath my roof. But did you indeed to Hades' house descend, son? And drag the triple-headed dog to light. Subdued with a fight or by the goddess given? With a fight. I was lucky enough to see the mysteries. And is the beast in yesterday's house? Hermion in the grove of Tithovnia holds him. Knows not your Estes, the your, your return to light. He knows it not. My zeal first led me here. Why the delay in your stay on the earth? To rescue Theseus from Hades' father. Where is he? Has he gone to his native land? To Athens he is gone. With joy escaped those gloomy shades. But come, my sons, attend your father into his house. You enter now with fairer expectations than you left it. Take courage then, no longer pour this stream of tears. And you, my wife, gather your presence of mind. Tremble no more, nor hang upon my robes. I have no wings, nor will I flee my friends. Ah, they hold me yet, still hanging upon my robes. How close you came to death, I will lead you, taking you in my hands like a ship that tows little boats behind it. 
for I do not refuse the care of my sons. This feeling is common to all mortals. Both the better off and those who have nothing love their children. There may be differences in property. Some abound, some have want, but for their children, all equal love. So the scene breaks there in a moment of triumph, right? Heracles is here. He's going to do what Heracles does, which is set all things right with his club and his hands. He's going to protect his children and his wife and his father. And the following scene set us up to follow this action in that order. The chorus sings the praise of Heracles. Lycus comes on stage and laments his fate that he cannot be king of the city, he cannot carry out that sacrifice. And then the chorus sings again a song of victory, praising Heracles, anticipating the glory of what's going to happen next. And then two new figures enter the stage, letting us know that we're in a different kind of story. Take heart, old men beholding her. Lyssa, the prodigy of light, and me, Iris, the servant of the gods. No evil to the town do we bring, but war against the house of one man whose fame reports the son of Zeus and your alchemy. While he was finishing his bitter struggles, necessity protected him, nor would his father Zeus ever allow me or Hera to do him ill. Since he has finished Euripides' mandate, Hera wills that he bathe his hands afresh in blood, his children's blood, and I assent. Hurry and restlessly, relentlessly seize his heart, unwedded daughter of black night. Drive madness on this man and child murdering confusion in his mind. Make his feet leap and let him float in blood until over the waves of a Charon, he wafts that beauteous band of sons, which like a garland wreathe around him, slain by his hand. So let him know the rage of Hera and learn mine. The gods indeed will be nothing, and mortals considered great if he does not pay his penalty. Illustrious is my lineage, sprung from night, my mother, and the blood of Uranos. And this my office, never to be admired by friends. I have no joy coming to dear mortals. But I wish to warn you and Hera before I see you rush headlong on this wrong, if you will obey my words. This man, into whose house you send me is, is not unknown to fame, either on earth or among the gods. The earth untrod by human step, the monster teeming sea, he tamed, and he alone restored the honours of the gods, which were by impious men trod underfoot. Thus I cannot advise you to plan these great evils. Don't you admonish the schemes of Hera and me. I am directing you to the better path instead of the evil one. The wife of Zeus did not send you here to be balanced. I call you Helios to witness what I do, I wish not to do. But if indeed the will of Hera I must execute and yours with speed, I will go. Neither the vexed sea that roars beneath its waves, the rocking earthquake or the thunder's rage and blasts of winds are like the violence which I drive into the breast of Heracles. I will rend these solid walls. I will desolate this house, but first I will slay his sons. And he that kills them shall not know they are his sons that fall beneath his hands, and he leaves off from my rage. And see, now at the doors he shakes his lock and rolls in silence his distorted gorgon eyes. His breathing is not balanced. Like a bull, dreadful in the assault, he roars and calls the Stygian furies. He howls with noisy fury, like dogs rushing on the hunt. I will dance you even more quickly, and I will play the reed of terror. But to Olympus, radiant Iris, speed your noble feet, while I unto this house of Heracles will hasten unseen. It and with the appearance of Lyssa and Iris, the play suddenly takes a completely different turn. 
one that we know is in Heracles' history, but once we, one we were not anticipating after those victory odes, unless you know Euripides. And Sophie, can, can you help us make some sense of what happens in that scene, in that radical turn? So that was the second uh, gripping turn in the play and maybe one that we really didn't anticipate. And in, if we think again about the staging, so that was a spectacular deus ex machina with two goddesses, two divinities showing up um, either on the, on the roof of the stage building or even in the air, uh, thanks to um, a stage um, device called the mechane, so the, um, the, the crane, sorry, I was missing the word. So they become and they announce this terrible um, turn in the, in the plot uh, instead of the happy reuniting between Heracles and his family, we will have this um, feat, of mad, feat of madness that will strike Heracles and lead him to um, kill his own wife and children. So Lisa is already announcing this and now it will happen on stage. But you may know that um, on the ancient Greek stage, we couldn't show such um, action. So the, the dramatist used several um, theatrical devices so that he could make the, the spectators experience the killing and ex experience even more than that, the whole collapse of the palace. Uh, and that's what's, what, what is ha happening next. So the chorus is an internal witness. The all men stay outside in the orchestra in the middle of the stage. And um, I mean of the, um, um, the central space outside, and they will describe the crisis and they will give, give us some details about the, the collapse of the palace. And they could hear to the screaming of the characters inside the palace and Amphitryon is inside. And he will, he will uh, scream, he will call the children and um, call them to flee so, so that the spectators can get an idea of what is happening inside. And um, the scene, the whole scene of the killing, it then brought to the knowledge of the spectators and, and uh, of the chorus through a messenger speech. So quite long messenger, messenger speech that we will not hear today, but I will just give you an idea of the way he describes this terrible scene in which Heracles performs um, another perverted sacrifice his, um, he, so the first perverted sacrifice didn't happen because Lycos finally wasn't able to kill um, uh, Megara and her children, but this time Heracles will do it himself. So that's even more tragic and terrible. Um, in his mania, Heracles, in fact, will believe he's killing Lycos and his sons. And even he's imagining that he's going out of Thebes and meeting Heristeus and killing his own, his children. But in fact, he's killing his own children. And so it's, it's really like he's playing a role. He's playing a play inside the play, but um, it's a terrible, a very grim make-believe play. And the result is that he's going to kill his own wife and children with the weapons um, that's, um, you know, with the bow, with the club that really define his heroism. And uh, so that's also a complete reversal. He's going to kill his own children with the weapons he wanted to give them to as a heirloom. So that's a complete reversal. Um, and then um, what I could say also to introduce the next scene is that, um, in, so when the, man, the madness ends, also with another divine intervention, Athena, Athena comes, um, we, we don't see her, but we, the messenger says she appears and she strikes um, Heracles with a stone and he then falls asleep. 
and Amphitryon and some servants tie him to a fallen pillar because the whole palace has collapsed. And we have to imagine that the same way as the spectators, the ancient spectators could imagine it because of course it was not uh, shown on stage. So he has fallen asleep. And so this speech from the messenger um, also prepares the spectators to see the results of this invisible action because um, at that moment, the dramatist used um, what we call the echiclema. So that was um, um, a wheeled platform that was going out um, from the door, the central door of the stage building, and which was used to uh, exhibit the results of an insight and you know, an internal action. So that's what we're going to see now. The Echiclema was used and Heracles was uh, asleep and then he, he wakes and discovers um, everything around him. Ah, I breathe. I see what I should see, the air, the earth and these rays of sun as on tumultuous waves and tempests my mind whirls and heaves. My breath is hot, deep and irregular, not right in its rhythm. Look, why am I like a moored ship with cords around my youthful chest and arms? Why to this shattered pillar am I bound? And I have corpses lying nearby. My winged arrows are scattered on the ground and my bow, which before would hang by my side to guard me by me, they too were guarded. Have I returned to Hades and measure back the gloomy course appointed by Eurystheus? That neither the rock of Sisyphus I see, nor Hades, nor the scepter of the daughter of Demeter, I am astounded. Where I am, I have no idea. Is any of my friends near or far off who will dispel this cloud that darkens over my senses? For I know nothing clearly of what is usual. My aged friends, shall I go near my ills? I will go with you, nor in misfortune forsake you. My father, why these tears? Why do you hide your eyes? Why keep distant from your beloved son? My son? For you are mine, even committing evil deeds. What have, what have I done this to cause your tears? That which even a god should learn about, he would mourn. Your phrase is great, but speaks not what the cause. You yourself set it. If now you are in command of your mind. Say what new ill is marked upon my life. If you are no longer a Bacchus of Hades, I would tell you. Oh no, this trust and darkness yet are in your words. <laughs> looking to see if your senses yet are sound. I don't remember being frenzied in my mind. My aged friends, shall I unbind my son? And say who bound me and disgraced me so. Know this much of your miseries, let the rest go. I will be silent to learn what I wish to. Oh, Zeus, from Hera's seat, do you see this? Have we again suffered hostility from her? Let the goddess be and support your own ills. I am ruined. What misfortune will you tell me? Look here. Behold the bodies of your sons. Ah oh, me. Unhappy. What wretched sight is this? Against your weak sons, this war you waged. Of what war do you speak? Who has destroyed them? You and your bow and son, cause from the gods. What are you saying? Have I done this dreadful deed? You, you were in a frenzy. You asked for terrible answers. And I'm, am I also the murderer of my wife? All of the actions are of your hand alone. Oh, me. A cloud of sorrow hangs around me. And for this, I groan over your fortune. And in my frenzy, I shattered my house. Only one thing I know. In all things you are wretched. Where did this ruin working frenzy seize me? There, 
at the altar's purifying flames. Wretch that I am, why should I spare my life, stained with the slaughter of my dear, dear sons? Should I not rather cast me from the height of some steep rock, or plunge my sword into my heart to be the avenger of my children's blood? Or give this body to the flames to purge away the guilt that stains my hated life? But to prevent my deadly purposes, see Theseus comes. My kinsman and my friend, I shall be seen and stand as a detested child murderer in the sight of those guests he holds most dear. What shall I do? In what dark solitude conceal my evils? Oh, had I wings or could I sink beneath the sheltering earth? But let me hide my head, close close muffled in my robes, for I am sh ashamed of these foul deeds, nor splattered with this guilty blood do I wish to pollute the innocent. I have come with others, those who on Asopos' banks their station hold, the armed youth of the Athenian land, bearing this allied spear to aid your son, reverend sir. For the report has come to the city of Erechtheus, that having seized the scepter of this land, Lycos with war assaults you, to repay with grateful zeal what my friend Heracles is due, who freed me from the realms below. I come, if I may do anything or this confederate force may be of use. Alas, why is this ground thus covered with the dead? Are my intentions thus frustrated? Have I, for recent ills, arrived too late? Who killed these boys? Whose wife do I behold lying here? The children do not fight in battle lines with the spear. But I have found some fresh calamity. O oh, Lord of the olive-bearing mount. Why do you address me with this mournful voice? We have suffered dreadful sufferings at the hands of the gods. What boys are these over whom your sorrows flow? My wretched sons, their father he, his hands with their blood stained. Turn your voice to happier words. You command what I wish. Oh, you have told me dreadful things. At once we are ruined. Ruined. What are you saying? What has he done? By frenzy's potion, world, drugged with the hundred-headed hydra's venom. This is an ordeal sent by Hera. But who is he that sits among the dead? That is my son, much labouring, who went with his giant slaying spear to fight the Philegrian plain along with the gods. Oh, what mortal ever was born to greater woe? You would never know any mortal man more exercised in toils, more exposed to dangers. But why does he hide his wretched head in his robes? He feels shame to behold your face, his friend, his relative, amid the blood of his slaughtered children. I came to mourn with him, uncover him. Remove, my son, this covering from your eyes. Throw it aside, show your face to the sun. A fellow struggler, a counterweight to your tears is here. I beseech you. Lo, at your knees I fall and grasp your hand and beard, a supplicant, while down on my aged cheek flow tears. My son, restrain the wild lion's rage which impelled you to unholy, bloody deeds, wishing to add evils to evils, child. Come now to you, whose wretched seat is on the ground I speak. Show to your friends your face. No darkness has a cloud so black which can conceal the misery of your troubles. Why do you wave your hand at me to signify terror, as though your words would bring pollution on me? I'm not concerned about sharing in your misfortune. For once, I had good fortune with you. Memory will recall the time when from the gloomy dead your hand brought me to the light. I hate those who let the impression of a friend's kind deeds fade from their heart, and they who wish to share his prosperous gale, but will not sail with unfortunate friends. Stand up, unveil your wretched head and look upon us. Whoever of mortals is noble, 
He bears the calamity sent by the gods and does not refuse. Theseus, have you seen this agony of my sons? I heard. I saw the ills you have pointed out to me. Why then have you unveiled me to the sun? Why not? Can mortal man pollute the gods? Flee, unhappy man, my polluting guilt. There is no stain of guilt for friends from friends. Thank you. I am not ashamed that I helped you once. And I, for being treated well, now pity you. I am pitiable. I have slain my sons. You, for your grace in others' ills, I mourn. Whom have you known with greater troubles? Your vast misfortunes reach from earth to heaven. I therefore am prepared and fixed to die. And do you think your threats are a care to the demonides? The gods regard not me, nor I the gods. Hold your tongue, lest speaking great things you suffer greater. I now am full of troubles and can contain no more. What will you do? Where does your rage transport you? Dead. The very place from where I came, I go under the earth. This is the language of an ordinary person. You, being free from misfortunes free, cannot counsel me. Does the much enduring Heracles say this? He had not suffered so much. There is a limit to endurance. The benefactor, the great friend to mortals. They do not at all avail me. Hera triumphs here. Greece will not allow you to die so rashly. So with that, we turn back to Heracles and his reflection on what has happened and his life. And he starts off to Theseus and he says to him, I'm going to prove to you in our translation that neither now nor in times past has my life been any kind of life. But I think that this a little bit undercuts how strong the Greek is, which uses the form abioton, I should not have lived. And he retells his heroic narrative in a way that one might not expect it to be told. And he tries to impress upon Theseus that his life is over. In fact, it should not have been lived, it should be ended, where, whereupon Theseus convinces him to return with him to Athens. So Theseus argues that this is all the will of the gods and that he should come to Athens and be honored for he has not chosen the path he has taken. And eventually Heracles agrees. The play ends in a scene with Heracles, his father, and Theseus generally, re generally reflecting on this final action. Put your arm around my neck and I will guide your steps. A friendly pair, but one a complete wretch. O reverend man, a friend like this man one must have. Blessed in her sons is the land that gave him birth. Theseus, Turn me back that I may see my sons. Is that dear sight a charm to ease your pain? I wish it, leaning on my father's breast. Lean here, my son. That wish is dear to me. Do you thus have no memory of your labours? All I have endured of hardship is less than this. If someone sees you acting like a woman, he would not praise you. Do I live so abject in your eyes? I didn't seem so before. Very much so. Being sick, you are not the famous Heracles. What sort of man were you when you were in the trouble, when trouble in the regions below the earth? I was the least of all men in courage. Then how can you say that I am debased in my troubles? Let's go. Farewell, aged sir. And to you, my son, farewell. Entomb my children, as I told you. And me, my son, who shall entomb me? I will. When will you come? When you have buried my children. But how? I will have them brought from Thebes to Athens, but my ill-starred sons lay in the earth. For me, who on my house brought ruin with shame, I will follow Theseus like a boat towed in his wake. Unwise is he who prefers wealth or power to the rich treasure of a good friend. We go in pity and grief losing in you our greatest friend. Thank you to all the actors for bringing that to us. 
I think we can now bring everybody together for a bit of a conversation about what just happened in the play. Um, I don't know uh, what your exposure to the, this player Heracles was before, but I can't read this play without wondering what just happened to me and am I going to be okay? So, and Sophie, can, can, can you talk a, talk a little bit about uh, the play to, to help us try to understand what's going on? Yes, it seems to be a play really uh, with lots of actions and lots of reversal. And maybe you, you may think it's a bit too much, actually, like when Theseus um, arrives, you know, just on time. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't heard much of him before. We just know that Heracles has saved him from Hades' house. Um, and so we know he's a, he's a good friend. And I think we will have to talk a lot about friendship, which is one of the most important topic in the play. But then, yes, he arrived just at the end to save his friend. So it seems maybe a bit, uh, I don't know how you would say that in English, but a bit too much, <laughs> uh, a bit artificial. Um, but I think that was really the way Euripides um, um, liked to do, to do tragedy. And it was probably very emotional, a, a little bit sensational. Um, so I was wondering how the actors could react to this. To this. Uh, you, some, some parts of the reading were very emotional and I really loved the way you, you expressed uh, Heracles, just the moment he also becomes aware of his deeds, of the fact that he has killed his, his own children. That's just, uh, how do you want to, to play that? You know, it's, it's just so much and so just the worst thing uh, it can happen to you in life. So uh, uh, yeah, if you just want to say something about that, um, I don't know, Evelyn or Tim or Richard. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely the, the challenge of Greek tragedy is mm -hmm. to, to try and sort of put yourself into, into these um, enormous, um, and huge, yes, these just enormous situations that they that someone like Heracles finds himself in. I mean, um, it's it's uh, it's I don't know. Kind of it's the, the writing helps. It's a beautifully written piece, and um, I just think the the themes are so great, and just the thought of losing your nearest and dearest um, is just enormous. I mean, I actually did. I, doing a play on Zoom is very new to me, as I'm sure it is to everybody, but it, it's amazing how moved I was in, in a lot of those later scenes. Um, it's just, it just really taps into um, every, all, our, all of our deepest kind of fears and insecurities and worries and uh, exposes them. And yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of powerful stuff. So I, I, I think you're all quite on about how emotional it is and how Euripides gets right to the heart of some of these connections that we value most. Uh, I want to talk more about friendship, the loss of children. And I do wonder um, a little bit about how hard it is for us to identify with such monstrous acts. I guess my question, maybe well, uh, both for Anne Sophie and for um, Paul, as you're thinking about choosing the scenes, how do we balance like this deep set human emotion against almost the absurdity of the play. Because I count four different instances of deus ex machina in the play, right? First, we're going one way, then Heracles comes in and vroom, we're going a different way. And then it seems like we're in one story. And then Iris and Lyssa come in. And then uh, Athena knocks Heracles out. And then just as we think it's all gonna be lament, oh, hey, it's Theseus again. So, so how do we understand the relationship between this almost uh, farcical plot with the deep set emotions that we're talking about. So if maybe both Paul and Anne Sophie can respond to that. One thought that, that I kind of came very strongly for me actually, um, and it's kind of, it was interesting for me being, being the chorus because I was sort of very much an observer and then also just being me as an observer with it, is how effective then the idea of not seeing the action becomes. Mm. So actually, it's amazing that we, it's almost like a jump cut. We go to seeing Heracles after it and not having seen him 
commit those acts and then seeing him realize what he's done to me is so much more interesting as a scene to play in fact as, as an actor I think that's kind of that's sort of the more interesting kind of stage uh, to see so I think um, yeah it, it is sort of extraordinary how it feels sort of it's almost sort of like five episodes in a soap opera um, that we that we kind of see but it's then sort of finding the sort of the truth there's truth in each one of those moments but it's then about sort of finding that truth within that scene. It feels much more kind of like separate scenes than some of the other plays perhaps. And actually it's finding the truth within those scenes in those moments. And then, yeah, these other sort of, obviously then when Iris and Lissa sort of come down, that sort of, that feels like quite a curveball um, to us. And I'm really interested as well to talk a little bit later on as well about the idea of who sort of doubles up as which characters as well within this. Um, but I think that once you actually sort of, um, Kind of are in those scenes the scenes in and of themselves there's truth within all of those and they're uncovering something that kind of connects very sort of strongly with us in very big ways like tim was saying i mean you know we don't go through what um, heracles has to go through um but it's then sort of and it's not up to us necessarily to kind of make all of those sort of connections and um, between the scenes um um so much because sometimes we're sort of jumping between characters Yes, I, I really agree with Paul. It's there is truth in each of these moments, and also I think in, um, there is maybe from Euripides or the way he constructs and builds the play. These um, many reversals, they are visible representation of the lack of control humans have on their lives. And you know we go that way, then we we are pushed to the other the the other direction, and that's you know if we think about the real life, maybe maybe it's not so different. We are always um, experiencing shifts in our fates, and we are pushed on one side and then another side, and so that there is um even though it seems maybe farcical, I think there is a very tragic message about our very weak agency. And what is also interesting in that play is that you can also see that the gods themselves are not completely in control of the action. When Lisa uh, appears, it's very interesting because in fact, she is reluctant to attack, to send, you know, to, to strike uh, Heracles with the feet of Manes, but it, it's Iris, so the messenger goddess, who is on the side of Hera, and it's her who pushes Lisa to act. But in fact, Lisa says, well, that's Heracles, you know, I don't want to, to, to attack him, I like him. <laughs> um, and um, so it's really the goddess, him, the goddess herself is not in complete control of what she can do. Um, so that's really, uh, I think there is a very tragic message on, on that, on our lack of control, but it's at several levels, also at the level of the gods. So building on that, I guess, moving to some more, some of the concerns of the actors, when you were preparing for these roles, did you have that sense of a lack of agency in the characters? And that sort of the turns were reflecting a lack of human control over events? And I ask this because in the last few sessions, we've talked about how our current experiences are making us see past narratives differently. And when I read this, you know, first starting out with the tyrant to despot who won't let us do anything, and then to the exigencies of fate that we can't control, I just felt, well, this is too real. So I guess maybe starting with Richard this time, did you get that sense of sort of marginalization and helplessness when you were developing your character? Um, helplessness, I suppose, is that bit when he says here, here is my neck, if you have the sword, and I suppose there's that there is definitely a sense of it doesn't matter how much fight I give up or, or give, this is dumb, it's suggested. Um, but, that it's, but it's all there in, in, in the words. And the, it feels like a very human adaptation as well, in actual fact. So the structure of the text gives, gives that feeling and, and the language that's used. Um, but there is, 
there is a feeling of everyone waiting for somebody to arrive, waiting for somebody else to come who is bigger than you that will sort it out. In an actual fact, there is no sorting out to be done because it's already sorted, but there is a constant waiting, a constant desire for somebody else to come and maybe take the onus off or the pressure off, maybe. There's also this very just interesting discussion that's raised, uh, debate about hope. I suppose hope is something we do always have agency over, you know, within our within ourselves. Like the decision whether or not to be optimistic, to believe that something better is coming, is 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 destined. Um, yeah, and this really fascinating discussion that happens in those early scenes about. Is there any point? Is it worse to hope? Is it worse to keep hanging on and to be disappointed? Or is it is it better to live in a kind of to create the, the you know the world and the future you create create for yourself? Is it better for that to be bleak, bleaker? Do you accept your fate? So we do have a textual question that's on YouTube, but before we get there, I, I do want us to take some time to think about the staging again. Anne Sophie has a lot of knowledge about staging of ancient plays that, that we don't. Um, and what we've talked about in earlier um, versions is the, some of the decisions that you guys have made in trying to use the small space of the Zoom screen to perform. Uh, so Tim and Evie, you got together again in this one, you did different lighting. Uh, so what are some things that influenced your decisions? And Anne Sophie, can you see sort of translating some ancient dramaturgy into this modern context? Yes, so sh should I talk first? Or? Sure. Yeah. Oh, gosh, <laughs> it's hard. But I, I think maybe one, one way to, to approach that is to think about the, the way ancient dramatists um, stimulated the imagination of the spectators because the, um, the material means were you know, quite modest. Um, in, in the play, the palace is supposed to collapse, but they were not able to show that. We know that they maybe they, they could use um, a prop to, which was called the Bronteon, but that comes from a quite late testimony, so we're not very sure about that. But that was a prop used to produce the sound of the of a, of a sorry a storm or the sound of a, of a collapse. So that's, um, that's one thing we know, but apart from that, everything um, was supposed to, to, to be imaging. So this, this kind of, um, you know, very um, visual action. Um, so the way we, <laughs> you perform today, it's just, you are reading, but that's just the power of the words that are able to to, uh, to stimulate the spectators or the listeners so that they can imagine the whole action. So in fact, we, we're not so far. We are, today we are lacking you know, all the, the great um, material means we have on the, on the stage in today's theaters, but just with the text, with the power of the text, we are able to, to make this thing exist. And in a way we are going back to this, um, you know, this, original um, um, minimalism of ancient Greek plays. So Paul, we're uh, building off that, are there changes in, in performance in the structure that you've thought about making that you've resisted? Um, do you have other plans you'd like to let out of the bag? <laughs> um, well, there's definitely, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that we're sort of trying to sort of uncover in this meeting, because this, as, as Tim said, this is sort of, this is like a new thing really to us. And um, and the first one was two weeks ago today, wasn't it? And we're just sort of trying to find new ways of doing this. Um, one one sort of thing that I'm really interested to sort of try out um, more is to try and find ways of, of, uh, of developing the idea of chorus. Um, and obviously today there was just uh, me as chorus. Um, I was, beforehand I've been experimenting with different sort of camera angles with that and I'll be honest the results weren't great so which is why I ended up not doing different camera angles because I just couldn't quite work out sort of actually that doesn't really kind of change too much for anyone but I was thinking with the strophe and the antistrophe sort of about sort of trying to change 
angle so I could almost sort of answer myself within that. Um, and, and I'm really interested in the idea of other, um, other design elements that you can incorporate. Because obviously if we were putting on a full production of this, you know, we'd be thinking in terms of, you know, costume, set, lighting, music, all these, you know, all these things that we would, that we take for granted and which suddenly are kind of stripped away from us. Um, and actually I'd be interested to sort of how we can use those in a, obviously a fairly minimalist way, because that's sort of the structure of it. Um, but one thing that actually that, uh, that I think is always sort of useful in, in, in storytelling actually is whatever restrictions you have then become useful mm. and then become sort of a great sort of form of, and to sort of fire your imagination. Actually, I, I kind of think it's easy if you've got a cast of 50 and you've got a limitless budget and you know, you've got the greatest, you know, everything in the world, then actually, then actually I, I sort of sometimes think the result ends up not being very interesting. Um, and actually it's when you have the restrictions that then interesting stuff can start to kind of fire off. Oh, we don't have enough people. Great, so we've got to play multiple characters. Great, so what happens? How do you do this? What's your solution to that? And, you know, we don't have a huge sort of, uh, you know, sort of prop sort of uh, list or anything like that. Fine, what do we, how do we kind of manage that? So I'm kind of intrigued to find out more about how we sort of can develop that I idea of things. And, and I think as well, one of the things that I, I felt sort of in, in this particular role of playing the chorus um, um, was there was something about the isolation that felt kind of really useful within that because it, I felt pretty helpless. And there was something um, about that idea of kind of, I'm, I'm waiting for someone a bit more powerful to come and just sort this out, ideally. Yeah. So that, I, felt, I, that felt useful for the play, but also kind of felt sort of very kind of when well, it's pretty timely as well. But um, actually, there was this sense of I'm here, I'm isolated, I'm this, you know, and I'm playing this chorus of of old men and constantly saying, well, if I if it was thirty years ago we were doing this, it'd be, it'd be no problem. But it's not, so it's a problem. Um, and that kind of so that sort of sense of being separated actually felt sort of um, felt like something you could use in performance. So I, I think there's something very ancient Greek, Paul, about saying that it's the limit that gives things meaning, right? And we <laughs> talked about that a little last week. Um, but now that, you know, Richard and Tim and Evie have had a couple, rendi a couple renditions to practice this, uh, I want to ask you guys about the limitations of not using your body and having the screen. So both um, Evie and Richard use light and angle differently when you, Alyssa and Iris. Um, but what's it like to not have access to that most important of actors' tools, your, your physical bodies, and just having face and voice? How has that changed your approach? It, it definitely, feels, definitely feels odd, I think, um, especially because the text and, like Tim said, the ideas and the, the themes and the events are so monumental. Um, and things that, you know, I think you spend a lot of time when you're preparing things like this normally to kind of see the effect that grief has on the human body and where that hits you and what that does to your breath and, and um, you know, everything about your physicality is shifted by, by emotion, by, you know, by what's around you. Um, but I think it is, it's a really interesting thing to have to try and channel everything um, yeah, through through the voice and experimenting with these little, you know, these little lighting, <laughs> lighting bits and pieces that maybe help, maybe don't. But it's a, it's a nice journey to be on to kind of work out the things that are effective, the things that aid the story and our connection to it and the things that take away and get in the way mm. unnecessarily. Yeah, I mean, as an exercise, I think it's quite interesting not being in the same room as some of the other actors, just in terms of you, the text becomes ever more important to, to get your predicament across and your request across. You really need to, all you've got are those words and um, 
you you can't kind of approach them you you've got to keep your social distance <laughs> from them because so you literally you've just got the text and i think that's as an exercise certainly that's um really interesting and useful so richard i think it was you who compared this a bit a few weeks ago to uh, radio acting or radio performance um how how has your reflection on it changed since then um I don't know, not, not, not loads. I suppose there's, because we can play around with um, lighting, which is very nice, by the way, the Irish <laughs> lighting. Um, because we can play around with things like that. It does give an, an added visual to it. But I think even though we have body available to us, it is there in the kind of structure of the words and the text as well. and. And some of those rhythms and the words and and uh, and, the, and the form of the text and the those big lovely open O's and calling up the gods are there anyway, whether we've got our bodies or mm. or not. Um, uh, what I find really off-putting is being able to see myself doing it. That's what I find, because there's never a job that you do where you watch yourself <laughs> while you're doing it. So um, I find that quite quite off-putting. Um, but there is a real sense of of radio to it, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with those these these added little bits of accoutrement that we can maybe play around with and find as we as we go through. I did resist wearing a veil, <laughs> I might say, for later earlier, but um, I'm now rethinking that. Well, I, what what I think is very different about radio and very different from if I saw any of you on television or in a movie is that it's stripped of the special effects, it's stripped of the scenes, and I'm really forced, and I don't mean this in a bad way, to watch your faces in a way that I don't think we actually do when we watch people on television or even the theater, right? Where we have the scenery and we have um, everything else to, to distract us. Um, and your expressions and the way that you are fully invested in the language um, really goes a great distance uh, to making it work in, the, in this genre. And I think that's something we could say is very different from an ancient context, right? Where we wouldn't have this type of intimacy with the face. Um, so as, as we close up again, I, I'd like everybody to have a chance to reflect a bit, but we do have this question. Uh, maybe Anne-Sophie, you can be the first last comment. Um, so people have asked about these mirrored similes of the ships in um, the play. And so there's yes. one that I'm looking at where uh, Heracles says to his sons, I'll lead you taking you into my hands like a ship that tows little boats behind it. And I can't think yes. of anything in Greek literature that's similar. So can you tell us anything about that? Yeah, that's a beautiful simile. And what's important is that it, it's, it is used twice in the play. And the first, the first time is when Heracles is with his son. So at the beginning of, of the play in the passage, we haven't read uh, today. Um, Megara remembers uh, for, former interactions between Heracles and his sons. And it's beautiful because he's the great hero, but she shows that he was a great father, a great dad playing with his, with his children. And this simile is used first to describe the way the way um, the children are, they, they just, um, I have to say, they stick to their father, you know, they jump on their father, they say, stick to him, and they play with him. And then, so this simile reappears just at the end, this time to characterize the relationship between um, the two friends, Heracles and Theseus. And so we can see how this relation of, um, um, Philia, so the love, the love for children becomes at the end of the play, the love and the, the, the alliance um, and the friendship between Heracles and Theseus. So that's really, I think, the meaning we can give to this return of the simile. And so it, it, it's fascinating the way the, the relationship, the relationship between the two friends is also uh, uh, said to be a tsugos philion. So it, a pair of friends, like you know, two oxen um, um, attached to a chariot. So it's very physical. We, you were talking about physicality and the the embodiedness of the 
of the the playing. So that's also a very physical image of friendship. So, um, as we come to a close, then, Anne Sophie, can you can you say a brief word about the experience of doing this? Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was really amazed um, by the, um, the way, even though we are separated and we're far away from each other, um, the emotions could flow quite um, in a very fluid way. And um, so the play is also very much about how you can go over distance, because at the end, Heracles, after his murder is isolated and the Amphitryon says to him um, um, or he says to his father why are you distant and that's really something important how we can um, go of a distance to 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 connect together and I think I I think we managed to do that tonight so thank you very much Thank you for joining us. Um, I know the rest of you have done this before but Paul Richard Tim and Evie can you let me know if anything else? Uh, if anything else has come up or how this experience was different, the same as the others? And we'll start with Paul. Um, I just want to say again, sort of um, how much I enjoy all of us kind of getting together from different places to do this. And just actually there were a couple of lines that sort of really jumped out for me. And I think I just sort of kind of want to repeat those, which is one was that this is the language of an ordinary person. Um, and then later on being sick, you are not the famous Heracles. And that kind of sense of this um, the sort of, I suppose, the pressure that they kind of they feels on for this person to be sort of uh, to be sort of Superman all the time as well, kind of felt quite, um, quite interesting. And then I also think I'm, I'm really kind of intrigued by that Iris and Lissa scene as well. I really, really loved that and just loved that sense of how do we how do we understand how someone goes mad or, or has an act of, of madness? Right. And that felt like a really, felt really kind of great to see that kind of played out sort of right in front of us. And so we'll go now to Lissa himself, uh, <laughs> Richard. Um, how, how is this sort of different from, from the last time you were with us? Um, those last few lines are, um, are when, uh, the, the last few lines of, um, and when will you bury me? And how will you come back? Oh, yeah. uh, they're quite, I mean, just what if, you know, you just have to watch the news for 10 minutes, but this, uh, it's a bit morbid, but the idea of dying in isolation, of of being, you know, of not somebody able, not being with you when you die or not being able to come back and give you the end of your life that you're due and not knowing when you're going to see that person again is, is uh, kind of resonated a bit today. I find it fascinating that um, regardless of the topic of what is happening to us there are themes of humanity that come through plays forever you know the the, 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 the yeah but, but that last little bit just resonated um i i live on my own so i've been i've been on my own for three weeks you know so that kind of that idea of oh when when will i get to see my friends again is it, you know is it, that, that really resonated um today in those last few lines yeah, those are those are really powerful. Tim and Evie, um, did, did you practice scenes together this time, or uh, did you just come together in this one frame for the first time all week? We were kind of we were discussing it. We didn't we didn't practice it, which which maybe we will next week. But <laughs> reading Greek tragedy together in isolation, why not? I mean, yeah. what a way to spend a day! Very uplifting. <laughs> Yeah, we yeah we didn't we didn't we didn't rehearse it as such, but we, yeah we 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 definitely sort of talked it through a lot and just and just again just, I mean as Richard has just said and and as I think I kind of commented um, last week just about these 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 big themes that uh, the, the humanity in these plays and it feels like we're living through you know as we've all said uh, living through this very extraordinary time um and suddenly i just every time i encounter one of these it's a real pleasure to be doing doing these readings suddenly greek literature just feels so important and so relevant and it's it's just it's an honor really 
to be to be involved. So thank you. No, oh, thank you. I mean, I I think Paul and I feel similar in this, and that having this to work on adds some structure. And one way to keep madness away is to impose structure where it might not be. Um, and you're right; it does make our work, both as your work in the theater and our work as as classicists, seem like it matters. So maybe we'll all have jobs when it's done. Um, maybe we could hope. Um, that would be nice. <laughs> heard of, uh, so for some final comments, um, uh, Greg Naj, the director of the Center for Atlantic Studies, has been um, watching us today. Greg. Um, you're still muted. Did you want to say hi? Okay, I just unmuted myself, which is a good thing that I did it only now. I just want to express my admiration for all of you. Uh, I thought this was a very moving production, and I'm so grateful to Evie and Richard and Paul and Tim and uh, my dear old friend uh, Anne Sophie and my dear old friend Joel. I, I feel that that. Um, uh, the, the people who were doing the acting are now new friends to me. Uh, my one worry was that when I parachuted in as one of the squares, it was only because I feel that my role is that of a supporter. And somehow being a supporter and being one of the squares in, in this beautiful theatrical production um, was, was, shall we say, uh, uh, uncomfortable. I, I almost wanted to um, um, cancel my video part, but then I thought, gee, that would that would indicate that I'm non-supportive and I am very, very, very supportive. So one thing I'm thinking about, uh, um, and, and here I turn to dear Lana and Keith and Sarah and Janet and Elaine is whether there could be some role for the audience. <laughs> mm. that, that is to say that maybe there could be a special place where the people who are cheering for uh, the production are situated <laughs> and where we're not front and center, almost taking away from the attention that is so important to um, highlight for uh, the roles when they happen. and. I know that there's one device, maybe it's that I didn't turn it on, where when you click on the upper right-hand corner, the person who is speaking is the only occupant of, of the screen. Maybe that's what everybody else was doing and I was doing Hollywood Squares, which, which was a big mistake on my part, because maybe I wouldn't have felt so self-conscious <laughs> about being one of the Hollywood squares. Any comments from any of the wonderful people who have put together the logistics of all, all of this? So I, I think Sarah wanted to say something. And to everybody watching, we do have a team, uh, Keith, Ellen, Lana, um, Janet, who are making all of this work possible. So Sarah? Well, just to answer your initial question, Greg, I think those who are watching the recording will see uh, just the person who's speaking, uh, but we have the option of, um, so of watching everybody. So, um, <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I, I, one, one thing uh, I hope I can, it, it's okay just to say, one of the things we were talking about was uh, the lack of agency of so many of these people. And it struck me that the one person who seems to have a certain amount of agency of all people is Magara and the children, because she actually chooses to dress appropriately for what's going to happen. And she's the only person that actually manages to wrest any kind of control out of this. Even though she's a victim, she's sort of a dignified victim and everyone else has got no control whatsoever. Um, so that was, that was one of the things that jumped out for me uh, of this play, which uh, was just so amazing to, to witness um, as, as a spectator. Yes, thank you. And I, I think that's in line with some of the more complex women that Euripides does put on the on the stage in general. Um, and that's a complex sun going by. Um, so any other any other comments um, as we go, Ellen? First, I want to thank you all because this is a splendid uh, opportunity for us to listen to all of you. Uh, I had just have a small question for uh, Anne Sophie. Uh, Anne Sophie, in in uh, in this uh, drama, 
which object stands out for you? <laughs> um, yeah, the bow. The bow is um, extremely important. And there is a scene which was not, not read today, but where um, Heracles addresses, addresses his bow. Um, he speaks to the objects. And he also imagines what the object will respond, will reply to him. So he's creating a miniature play where you know he interacts with the objects and the objects are speaking. So definitely that's one fascinating um, in physical and verbal interaction with an object on the Greek tragic stage. Thank you for this question. Good one. Um, Thank you. So next week, we'll be gathering again at the same time, 3 p.m. Um, here on the East Coast, and we'll be reading Euripides' Bacchae, if, I, if I'm correct. So thank you for everybody for supporting this and making it happen, for the actors for reading, Paul for having the idea, and Sophie for being our guest, Greg for being our special audience member, and everybody watching along. Thank you. I hope everybody has a great week.